The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This is Your FBI. This is your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. Any time in the next half hour while you're listening to this program, your telephone may ring. This is the Radio Checking Bureau. Is your radio turned on? Why, yes, it is. What program are you listening to, please? It's This Is Your FBI, just starting. Do you know who sponsors that program? Of course I do. It's the Equitable Life Assurance Society. Just this morning, my Equitable Society representative said the middle commercial would have something interesting for me to listen to. It's about the Equitable Society's fact-finding chart for fathers and mothers. So, naturally, I know that... This is your FBI, is sponsored by the Equitable Society. In about 15 minutes, I'll be back with full information about the Equitable Society's fact-finding chart for fathers and mothers. Tonight's FBI file, Two Tickets to Nowhere. Tonight's case from the files of your FBI concerns the criminal activities of an undesirable alien. Before you hear the story behind this crime, though, the Federal Bureau of Investigation would like to make one fact perfectly clear. It does not now, nor has it ever, worked on the theory that all aliens are undesirable. That way lies ever-deepening prejudice. Aliens to this shore have that name only because they were born in another country and not because they possess any qualities, either good or evil, which are not possessed in the same proportion by any equal number of Americans. The roster of those who have come to this nation from other shores and contributed to our greatness is a long one. There are also those who come to America and refuse to pay any heed to our laws. They would be criminals in any nation, because basically the laws of every democratic nation are very similar. This latter type of alien, these undesirable aliens, have contributed their share to our national crime wave, for like our Native American criminals, they too are capable of lying, cheating, and killing. Tonight's file opens in an exclusive cafe located in a large South American city. The head waiter is attempting to prevent a rather shabbily dressed man from entering. My dear man, if you insist on keeping me outside the confines of this cubicle of iniquity... But, Senor Monet, I have my order. The last time you were here, you started a big fight. My dear Raphael, if you do not immediately escort me to Mr. Ludlow's table, I shall be forced to reveal to your employers what I know about you. Come, I shall take you. There, that's the Here you are, Senor Monet. Thank you. Uh, sorry I'm late, Mr. Ledlow. I'm George Monet. Hello. <laughs> My reason for being detained was very amusing. <laughs> you see, Let's I... get down to business. Oh, oh, very well. How did you happen to call me? How did you know who I was? Mr. Ledlow, I've been down here from the States now for almost ten years. My contacts are excellent. I pick up stray bits of information about most of the new arrivals, and sometimes that information comes in handy. A shake artist, huh? I rarely resort to blackmail. Why did you call me? Well, I've been thinking about going back to the States now for quite a while. However, I don't want to make the trip unless I can go back and live like I used to. Top cabin. You came to the wrong place to make a touch. Uh, three months ago, you were shipped out of the United States as an undesirable alien. Look, I don't want to... Mr. Go- Ludlow, any resentment you may be feeling will dissolve completely when I tell you that we can make a deal. What kind of deal? You look like a man to whom the taste of revenge would be sweet. 
Would you like to outwit the immigration authorities and go back to the States? It cannot be done. Then why not? I'm too hot for anybody to handle. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, you're ice cold. What's your pitch? It's a trade secret. Then I don't play. Why not? I don't want any proposition where we get on a boat, go to the coast of Florida. Then we swim the last quarter of a mile. That's not for me. Well, it's not for me either, sir. If we go back my way, we go back with passports. Legitimate passports. It doesn't sound right. Mr. Ludlow, I can get passports, but I've got no money. You've got money, but you can't get a passport. It seems to me we ought to get together. What's it going to cost me? A paltry 2500 I can't pay you until we get back to the States. Well, in that case, there'll be a slight extra charge. The price for the passport payable when we arrive in the United States is $5,000. You made a deal. A few days later, in an FBI field office in the northeastern section of the United States, Agent Paul Auburn approaches the desk of Special Agent Jim Taylor. Jim? I'm in line for congratulations. Oh, now, don't tell me you're a father again, Paul. Oh, but Ethel found an apartment yesterday, and we moved in last night. <laughs> Fine. Now that you've got the housing problem off your mind, you can start thinking about something else. Is there something else? Oh, yes. The SAC just assigned us to work on a case together. Mm, what kind of a case is it, Jim? Impersonation of a federal official. What's the story? Well, a man named George Monet got a job with a government agency in South America as chief clerk. Uh -huh. He was put to work while his application was being sent to Washington for routine checking. Now, when Washington found that he was a disbarred lawyer with a criminal record, Monet was discharged. Uh -huh. However, before he left the office, he managed to steal some official stationery in a book of government transportation request blanks. Now, on one of the letterheads, he typed out a set of credentials identifying himself as an official of the United States government traveling on official business. I see. He then presented his hand to work to the foreign office, was granted a passport without delay, and obtained a visa to enter the United States. Is he back in this country now? Oh, wait a minute. You haven't heard all of it yet. He not only got a passport for himself, but he also got one for a companion who also had forged credentials. That passport was made out to a John W. Smith. And who is John W. Smith? I have no idea, Paul, but they both landed in Miami yesterday on the Clipper. Well, they could be a long way from Miami by now. Oh, that I know. Are there any leads at all? Well, we've got Monet's description and his picture. Got anything on Smith? No, no, not a thing. Have you got any ideas on procedure? Yes, I've been going over the passenger list on that clipper they came back on, and Martha Dalton, the movie star, was one of the passengers. Oh. Well, how does that help, Jim? Well, I think there were probably some photographers at the airport from her studio to take publicity pictures. Well, that's logical. So I'm going to try and get a copy of any that were taken and see if Monet and his friends show up in any of the backgrounds. <laughs> Back in the States again, Ben. Fine. The land of the free. That's us. Free. Yes, that's right. And we don't have to listen to any more of those marimba bands. Up here, when you put in a nickel, out comes Benny Goodman. You're and, right. Uh, speaking of a nickel, our strategic position would be considerably improved if we had a little money. Yes, I know. Uh, the operator say how long it would take to locate your girl? No. Yeah. It's been quite a while now since you put that call in. Ben, I, uh, I trust nothing has happened to stem the tide of true love. You've been gone for three months, you know. And from the picture you showed me, she's rather attractive. Look, talk about yourself for a change. Oh, I'd be delighted to. Is there any particular phase of the subject you care to have me discuss? You, uh, going to be a lawyer again? That is a decision which has been irrevocably removed from my domain. Uh, did you ever hear of a hoodlum named Gentleman Joe Ferguson? Yes. I used to represent Gentleman Joe till one fateful day when, in order to get an acquittal after a messy affair in which he was involved, it became necessary for me to put a small fix in with one of the jurors. Through some quirk of fate, the fix was discovered, and I was disbarred. Uh, uh -huh. telephone's ringing. Must be my call. Hello? Are you the party to call Miss Kitty Wayne at Evergreen 38897? Yes, that's right. Here's your party. Hello? Hello, Kitty. This is Ben. Ben! Ben, honey. How are you? Oh, fine, well, fine. When did you get 
back. Oh, just a little while ago. Oh, where are you? Florida. When am I going to see you? Well, that depends on you. Look, I need some money. How much? Five hundred. I can get it to you. Good, baby. Look, send it care of John W. Smith, Daytona Beach, my Western Union. Daytona Beach, okay. Good. Uh, honey, have you still got those keys I left with you? Yeah. Good. Now, one of them is for a safe deposit box. That box has a map in it. Map of what? The location of some money that me and Steve buried. Baby, if we dig that up, we're going to be fixed fine. Oh, all I care about is that you're back. How did you ever manage it? Well, I met somebody down there who worked an angle. We both came back together. Is he coming north with you? He thinks he is. But... I already made arrangements to have him taken care of. Jim, are those the pictures of Martha Dalton? That's right, Paul. Look at the background of this picture through this glass here. Well, that's Monet, all right. Now, take a look at that man standing beside Monet. Now, that, that face looks familiar to me. Now, you may have seen it before on a wanted notice. The last time he was arrested, he was using the name of Ben Ludlow. Ben Ludlow? He was deported, but obviously it didn't stick. Well, I was stationed on the West Coast when he was picked up. What was the charge? Now, he and a friend of his named Benson held up a bank messenger. They got over $60,000. Well, what happened to the money? We never found any of it. Well, what happened to Benson? He carried the gun. He's still in prison. Has uh, an alarm gone out on Ludlow yet? Yes, I've already called police headquarters, and the alarm went out on Monet, too. How long ago was that, Jim? About an hour ago. Paul, why don't you go over to Ludlow's old address, and I'll go to headquarters. If neither of us gets anything tonight, we'll start again first thing in the morning. Ben, it's wonderful having you back. <laughs> How do you think I feel? Huh? Oh, this was just like old times. Being on the town, closing all the saloons. Yeah. Got your key? Oh, sure. Here you are. Go ahead. Thanks. Welcome home. What? Who are you? Well, let me introduce myself. My name is George Monet. He's the one who got me back into the country. But I thought you... Did you think I was dead, Miss Wayne? Oh, well, <laughs> Perhaps I... I'd better explain. Ben hired some trench and hoodlums in Florida to take care of me, but by some coincidence, they both happened to be former clients of mine. How did you get in here? Oh, that was a simple matter. I told the superintendent that it was Miss Wayne's birthday and that I wanted to surprise her. Happy birthday, Kitty. I never told your name. Dear Ben, do you remember my going to the phone booth to call a friend after you spoke to her last night from the saloon in Daytona Beach? Yeah. I called the long-distance operator. And she told me whom you had called. Smart boy. Well, I make it a practice always to do the best I can. Well, what do you want? He wants $5,000 for getting me that passport. Oh, no, Ben, you're wrong. What? When I returned to the scene of some of my former triumphs, I renewed acquaintances with some of my other ex-clients. They told me that you and your former partner had a lot of money put away somewhere. What about it? I want 50% of it. You want 50%? Uh, uh, before you answer, let me tell you something. I have a half a dozen letters planted in different places. And if I don't maintain my present state of good health for the next 48 hours, the people who find those letters will know what happened to me. You think of everything, don't you? My legal training. Ben, what are we going to do? Well, there's really only one thing he can do. Ben, shake hands with your new partner. <laughs> Turn in just a moment to tonight's exciting case from the files of your FBI. Now, listen. As the next 60 seconds tick away, several hundred American parents will make a decision. A decision that will vitally affect the whole future happiness and security of their families. What is that decision, Mr. Keating? During the next minute, they will hear about the Equitable Society's famous fact-finding chart for fathers and mothers. We know from experience that every time we describe this chart, hundreds, sometimes thousands of fathers and mothers say to themselves, that fact-finding chart is just what we need. 
Let's ask our equitable representative for one right now. It brings to light eye-opening facts that show you just what income your family would need to be well-fed, well-housed, and well-clothed if you were no longer there to support them. That's something I never figured out. You'll have the answer in five minutes with this Equitable Society chart because you're guided at every step by easy-to-understand pictures. For the first time, you know just what income your family will need to keep together during the critical years until your youngest child finishes high school. Mr. Keating, you've sold me on the idea of getting one of those charts. What do they cost? Not one cent. Phone your Equitable Society representative tomorrow to bring you a fact-finding chart for fathers and mothers. Or send a postcard, care of this ABC station, to the Equitable Life Assurance Society. Your request will be forwarded to the nearest Equitable representative. The more you love your family, the more gratified you will be that you decided to get the fact-finding chart for fathers and mothers prepared for you by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. And now back to the FBI file, Two Tickets to Nowhere. The people in tonight's case from the files of your FBI, the undesirable alien, the disbarred lawyer, the young girl who acted as their accomplice, they may seem to you like unusual characters, people with whom you feel you are unlikely to come into contact during your everyday life. And yet, if that is what you think, then you are deluding yourself. Because no matter how far you regard yourselves as being from the environs of crime, you are actually in its midst. The victims of no more than 10% of the million and a half major crimes committed in this country in the past year were other criminals. In the remaining 90%, the victims were decent citizens. Decent citizens who probably thought that they were far from crime. Decent citizens like you. Tonight's file continues at the local FBI field office. Well, Jim, it's a bright new day. I hope we get a bright new clue on Monet and Ludlow. I could sure use one, Paul. I stopped by police headquarters. They still hadn't gotten anything. I checked yesterday at Ludlow's old address. The landlady said that he hadn't been near the place. Of course, she may be protecting him. No, I don't think so. When he was arrested last time, she helped us by calling and letting us know when he arrived home. Uh Oh? Oh, I found out one thing. They both are definitely here in town. How do you know, Jim? I took the pictures out to the airport and showed them to the porters out there. Oh. Which plane did they come in on? They each came in on a different flight. That's what makes my suspicion even stronger, that Ludlow had the money he and Benson stole put away somewhere up here. I think you're right. Hey, Paul. Paul, Benson knows where that money is. I'm going up to prison and interviewing. I think we have enough to make him talk. Wayne, as an ex-attorney, I wouldn't advise driving over 50. I don't want any of your advice. Uh, Mind if I speak to you, Ben? Go ahead. I assume you know what will automatically happen to the two of us if your girlfriend should be stopped for speeding? That's right. Get it slow down. Okay. Uh, Tempest fugit. The whole order changes. What does that mean? Uh, Just thinking to myself. People used to pay a lot of money for my advice. Now I find it difficult to give away. Ben, shouldn't the place be right near here? Yeah, yeah. It isn't very far. You know, I think I should take my share of those subterranean pieces of eight and go to Paris. I've always understood that a man of culture is welcome there. Especially if, in addition, he also happens to possess (laughs) large banknotes. Kitty, slow down here. Okay. All right, now stop. Have we arrived at the pot of gold? Yeah. Come on, get your shovel. Let's start digging. Paul? Paul, you want to go on a treasure hunt? Well, sure, Jim. What's the treasure? $51,000. Whoa! Count me in. I was up to see Benson in prison. He drew this map for me. Oh? Yeah. This is where he and Ludlow buried their money just before their arrest. He drew this from memory, so some of the details may only be approximate, but I think we ought to be able to find it. Well, what made him tell you where it was? Well, I told him that Ludlow was back in this country, that he returned here to town. I convinced him that the only reason that he would have come back up here was to get that money. He finally agreed that Ludlow must be double-crossing him, and 
He drew the map. Good. And where is this place? It's about 20 miles north of here on Highway 1. You suppose uh, Ludlow and Monet are on their way up there now? I don't know, but if they are, I think they'll find a reception committee waiting for them. What do you mean? I called the local police up there and told them to be on the lookout. Oh, I also told them that we'd give them a hand. So come on, Paul, let's get up there. No, no. I, I think you can count on our stopping work when one of us finds the satchel of money. Well, what's taking so long? Uh, for one thing, that map you're holding hardly looks like one that was made by Rand McNally. We have thus far dug a ditch somewhat resembling the marginal line without finding anything. Oh, we'll find it. And I certainly trust so. I hate to think that I did all this work for nothing. You're both far away from where the X is on the map. I, I got it. I got it. Honest, Ben? Ben. Ben, would you mind if I feasted my eyes on it? Let me see, too. There it is. Fifty-one thousand. I never saw a more beautiful picture. Well, I am now affluent enough to live for a while. Uh, What is it? Look, up there on the hill, there's a man standing there. Looks like a cop. Let's get back in the car. Okay. You down there. Wait a minute. Wait for me. Oh, no, no. This is where we break the partnership. Honey, let's get out of here. And I chased the car, Mr. Taylor, but they got away. Oh, I understand perfectly, Sergeant. Don't take it so hard. They get away from everybody once in a while. I fired five shots at them, but I didn't hit with any one of them. Well, the wood's pretty heavy up through here. That road curves a lot. You can't very well shoot around trees. After I gave up chasing them, I came back here and found that other man. Oh, that's George Monet. Oh. Ludlow wasn't driving the car. Oh? There was a girl with him. Sergeant, you didn't get close enough to get the license from the car, did you? No, I didn't. It was just starting to get dark when they drove away from there. Mm. And the girl didn't have her lights on. I see. I don't even know what kind of a car it is. All I know is that it's a sedan. Now, cutting through these woods, you say there's no other road they could get to except Highway 56, is that right? Unless they turn around and come back past here. I don't think it's very likely they'll do that. The minute I lost them, I called our two patrol cars and had them set up a roadblock on either end of the woods. Uh-huh. So we should be hearing for one of those cars pretty soon. Not swell. If they decide to hole up in the woods, we shouldn't have too much trouble going in and getting them. Well, that may take more manpower than we have available, Sergeant. I just well, overdo it. Yeah, what is it, Paul? I just took a call that came in on the two-way for the sergeant here. Huh? Was it from one of the patrol cars? Yes, they reported that a car with its lights out, going about 80 miles an hour and headed north on Route 56, just sideswiped the patrol car and broke through the roadblock. Paul, I'm glad the sergeant knew about this shortcut to Route 56. We saved quite a bit of time coming this way. Yeah, but I wish we knew who that girl is with Ludlow, or even what the car they're in looks like. Here's the crossroads. Well, Ludlow could have gone either way from here, Jim. Paul, look down there. See that car? Yeah. Look at it go. It must be Ludlow. Well, let's see if we can catch him. Jim, according to the map, there's a rise in the road just ahead. Yeah, I see it. I think we're gaining on them. Should be at this speed. Here's the top of the hill. Jim, they're nowhere to be seen. Hey, wait a minute. That drive-in theater we just passed. That's where they must be. Let's go back and see. What's the deal here, Jim? People sit in their cars and watch the movie. The attendant says he didn't see which lane that last car went into. Well, there must be a couple of hundred cars inside this place. Yeah, and the show breaks in three minutes. They'll all be streaming out of here then. Come on, Paul, let's start looking. Understanding is my business, oh, young lady. I've seen this. What? I've seen this picture. Now lean but back on the leave. couch and no, talk. I like it. Talk about anything that comes into your mind. Very well. What are you thinking? I hope we duck them. What? I said I hope we duck those cops. I remember when no. I was a little girl. 
I had pigtails, and there was a boy on our block named Tommy Dillon who used to carry my books to school. Go on. Keep talking. I don't remember much about the years I went to high school. Well, that's because you don't want to remember. Is this thing over soon? Hmm, let's see. Oh, I know she and the doctor get married. But they when? Horrible I remember. Poor darling. Poor, poor darling. They've gone into a clinch. Does that mean anything? Yeah. It's going to finish. I love you, Kurt. Olivia. Hey. What? Two guys out there walking around. Well, they're not wearing uniforms. We can't take any chances. Put your arms around me quick. What for? We've got to look like everybody else that's parked here. Hey, what is this? Put your hands up and step out of there. Now look, me and my You girl... heard me, Ludlow. Now move. All right, miss, you too. I got nothing to do with him. We just had a date to see the picture. We're making it a double feature now. Come on. George Monet was tried and sentenced to a 10-year term in a federal prison. Ben Ludlow also received a 10-year sentence and deportation. His girlfriend was turned over to state authorities. Tonight's case from the files of your FBI was closed successfully because Special Agent Taylor remembered that the car which had been sideswiped on Route 56 was a police car and was painted white. In examining the cars at the drive-in theater, he looked for one that had a fresh dent and some particles of white paint in the scratches. That combination, the ability to assimilate facts and later to make application of them in the solution of any crime, is part of the training which every special agent receives before he graduates from the FBI Academy. Each of those special agents has a big job. This is a nation that at the last census had 140 million people in it. At the present time, there are fewer than 4,000 FBI special agents. A ratio of one special agent for every 35,000 Americans. For that numerical reason alone, the training mentioned above is an essential part of every special agent's equipment. Equipment he is given in order that he may better help protect the property and lives of you, the American people. just a moment, we will tell you about next week's case from the files of your FBI. But now, listen. Don't forget, the seconds are ticking away. Time is speeding by. So don't delay. Get that fact-finding chart for fathers and mothers right away. Then you can make sure that no matter what happens to you, your children will eat good food, live in a comfortable home, wear clothes they're not ashamed of, get an honest-to-goodness start in life. Phone your Equitable Society representative soon. Or send a postcard to the Equitable Society, care of this ABC station. Your request will be forwarded to the nearest representative of the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, we will dramatize another case from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. An exciting account of crime on the high seas. Its subject, Grand Larceny. Its title, Voyage of Terror. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious. And any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. The author was Jerry D. Lewis. Your narrator was William Woodson, and Special Agent Taylor was played by Stacey Harris. This is your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. This is Larry Keating speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. And inviting you to tune in again next week at the same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society will bring you another thrilling story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Voyage of Terror on This 
is your FBI. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. <laughs>